Okay, so um, obviously in the morning sessions you saw, you know, kind of the, the basics of Bayes nets. Um, to some extent, that's going to cover a lot of what you what you need to do, at least initially. So that's the good news. You, you know, that's all you have to really worry about. Um, I, I think, as you you know, if you're if you're working through these problems and you find that they're you know a little bit tricky or you're not entirely sure about what's going on, don't worry because you've got plenty of time to become you know a much more expert at Bayes nets. Um, it's something that you know, building up an expertise in Bayes nets, uh, not just you know the, the the basics of it, but you know understanding how they click together and what works <coughs> and what doesn't. That takes a, a long time to kind of uh, build up and develop. Uh, and on this pro project, you'll have plenty of time to be build up that experience. So uh, you shouldn't have to fret too much if you, you're not quite on top of everything by the end of uh, the session. Um, OK, so as I said, the morning sessions um, were on the key stuff that you need to know. Uh, this is also quite important. So we're going to look now at um, decision networks. So decision networks add. Uh, basically two types of node to a network, a decision node and what's called utility nodes, which we'll see uh, shortly. Um, and so instead of just modeling, well, what does a system do? We can say, well, what happens if we uh, make one choice over another? And how does that you know, affect the value that we get from different uh, outcomes? So we've actually been explicitly told that we can't model decision networks in, in BARD. <laughs> uh, we can't, as in, do decision problems, is my understanding. That's what, well, Kevin had mentioned to me that um, basically they didn't want uh, the intelligence analyst um, making decisions. Um. Uh, yeah, look, the, f the, final, the final format for the questions um, has yet to be announced. Yep. Uh, so um, there, there's some sort of psychological, psychologically, people feel like the analysts are there to advise and the, and the policy makers are there to make decisions. Yeah. Having said that, um, if you're advising someone on a decision, then you might well want to think about the costs. That's right, yeah, I think that's critical. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. um, even though we might call it uh, a cost-benefit analysis, <laughs> yeah. right, instead of a decision analysis, which yep. is a political reason, mm -hmm. you might well do them uh, for some of the questions. Okay, yeah. Well, that's good to know because I think that's... I've seen some of the problems that you guys had put together, and most of them were decisions. <laughs> um, yes, yes. Yeah, so. And in the I think long run, we certainly think that's a good feature to have in yeah. software. Yeah. Okay, so this is good. So, probably not um, as useful immediately, but definitely um, down the line. And I think the concepts you, you really ought to know, um, because regardless of whether you're explicitly including the, that um, in the models, you'll need to um, be aware of it as you're um, building software that encourages that kind of thinking. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, decision making under uncertainty, that's what we're going to look at. So that's uh, ubiquitous. It's, pr it's pretty much what we do um, all the time. There's very few decisions which we make which are entirely certain, and they're not really called decisions, they're just called you know, acting. <laughs> um, so there's different kinds. For instance, you know, uh, shall I take my raincoat today? It will depend on whether it's raining or not. Uh, and maybe other factors with the weather. Uh, you might say, okay, shall I, you know, will I try the, the prawns? Uh, that will depend on whether you think it's, um, you know, a safe option to try the prawns, whether you think you, you're going to enjoy them, um, so forth. There's different kinds of uncertainty involved in here, uh, in these different kinds of questions. Uh, most problems have both kinds of uncertainty. So, for instance, what's the probability that uh, swine flu will turn into a highly toxic uh, virus during 2009, uh, back in 2009? Um, so that's essentially we're asking a probability. We're just saying, you know, what's the probability that, that this event could occur? Uh, or what's the probability that it will lose its infectiousness? Okay, so all we're focusing on there is what we focused on in the previous sessions, just the probability of something happening. Uh, but we can also look at this value. And we have some uncertainties about, uh, sorry, values and disvalues. OK, so we can say, what's the disvalue of losing a life to the flu? OK, so that's a different kind of uncertainty. We're not saying we're not sure whether it will happen or not. Uh, we're just saying, OK, we're unsure of you know, how much it, it costs a person or how much it's, it's worth to us. 
uh, or what's the disk value of an in infection overcome. So that's, there's values are, are kind of attached to everything. So there's these two, two concepts, the probabilities that we've dealt with before and we understand, and then we've got values attached to different things. Uh, so Bayes nets can be extended quite straightforwardly um, to, to handle this kind of decision making. Uh, it's, it's quite a simple extension. We can do everything that we did before for the probabilities and then we just add in extra nodes to say this is the actions that we've got uh, and this is the values attached to certain outcomes. Uh, so uh, the preferences between uh, different outcomes, uh, we can come to a, an idea of what the value should be using something called utility theory. So we can use that to uh, essentially rank people's preferences and uh, in some cases you know, compare between d different people. Uh, and the combination of utility theory and probability theory is decision theory. Okay, so how do we combine them? Okay, just suppose that we've got our probabilities, we're comfortable with creating those. Suppose that we've also got some, we've somehow elicited values from, uh, from people that uh, are affected by uh, some action. Uh, this is how we would combine them in this, this equation. So is anybody familiar, familiar with expected values? Encountered them before in statistics? Okay, not a problem. So what happens here is we say, okay, if A is, a is an action, uh, and E is a set of evidence, you can kind of ignore E here. So uh, we can pretend there's no evidence or uh, that we've got some given set of evidence. It doesn't really uh, affect things. But say we've got some action, so we're looking at the expected utility of some action. Uh, what we say is that there's a whole set of outcomes from that action, possible outcomes. Okay, so these are the OI. Okay, so we've got various values on the different outcomes um, that could happen. So that's our utility function, u. So that defines for a given outcome, this is the value that we would attach to that outcome. And then we just weight that by the probability. Okay, so it's actually quite, quite simple. And then we sum it all together. And that's our expected uh, utility. So what we're saying is, okay, um, if I choose, um, say for instance, to um, drive the car today, I might have, you know, I might get in late if instead of going, you know, going by train, for instance. I might have an accident, which is a, a lower probability event, but you still want to kind of factor that into your decision. Um, so you've got all these possible worlds that la are laid out in front of you. And for each of those possible worlds, you've got some value attached to it. So you say, you know, if I get there uh, late, then that's bad. So that, that has this value. Um, if I get there, you know, early, that's good. That has positive value. If I die in a crash, that's pretty bad. So I want to avoid that. Um, so you've got all these values, and they have nothing to do with the probability of those outcomes. Okay? But you also have a probability of the outcome. So all we're doing is we're then combining it all uh, to get our expected value, or expected utility. Okay, so let's take a look at an example that we saw before with the global warming um, hypothesis. So we've got essentially our outcomes up here. We've either got the, the case that global warming is false or that it's true. And then over here we've got our possible actions. We can either do nothing or we can curta uh, curtail carbon dioxide emissions. In each of these cases we've got some utility associated with it. So there might be some cost associated with, whoops, some cost associated with curtailing carbon dioxide uh, and there'll be some benefit or harm from global warming being true or false. Okay, so we can calculate the expected utilities exactly the same way as we saw on the previous slide. Uh, we would just say uh, the probability times, uh, so P times utility 1, or 1 minus P times utility 2. So that's that first row. Uh, and then we do the, exactly the same thing for the second row. And then that gives us our expected utility for each of these two actions. Okay? So let's see a numerical example. Okay, so let's pick some numbers here. We're going to be ridiculously conservative, okay? And we're going to say, all right, it, despite the fact that almost, you know, there's universal uh, agreement that global warming is actually true, uh, we're going to say, oh, actually, we just have a, you know, a, a uniform prior over it. We say 50-50 chance that it may be true or it may not, okay? Uh, then we're going to pick some really conservative numbers in here. So w a useful thing to do when you're picking utility numbers 
uh, is to start off with kind of an anchor point with your zero. Okay, these numbers are are arbitrary. Okay, the numbers, well, not entirely arbitrary, but the the specific numbers are arbitrary. What's important is the relative rank and the relative uh, weight. So the you know how much, uh, how many times more something uh, is valued or disvalued over another. But the specific numbers don't matter. Okay, so say for instance in here we say, okay, if we do nothing and the global warming hypothesis is false, uh, we'll just treat that as our neutral case. We'll say zero. It's neither positive nor negative. If uh, we do nothing and global warming is true, then that's really bad. Lots of people are, you know, going to die, be, you know, displaced. Uh, there's lots of costs involved in the cleanup. It's a big, big mess. Okay, so we'll put that as minus 100. That's we can treat as our other anchoring point. Everything else uh, we can do relative to this. Actually, I updated these slides and it's not here. Anyway. <laughs> um, okay, so what we do here in the curtailing carbon dioxide case, we say, all right, if global warming isn't true, there's some cost associated with doing this. We're going to say it's 1 one hundredth um, the cost of, you know, if global warming happens to be true. And we're going to say, well, um, if we've curtailed carbon dioxide, then global warming won't end up being, you know, won't end up having any negative consequences. So we've avoided all of that, and it's still um, just one one hundredth. Okay. Okay. So we calculate our expected utilities for each of the actions. Uh, very simple as before. We just multiply through, uh, and we get negative fifty for do nothing, and we get minus one for curtail. So basically, we're saying. Um, doing nothing is 50 times worse um, than containing carbon dioxide. <coughs> okay? So it's important that you don't place any specific interpretation on these numbers. It's just a way to rank your preferences and say how much more you like something than something else. Okay. So basically there we calculated each the expected utility for each action. Uh, and the idea behind Bayesian optimal decision um, theory is that you choose the action which maximizes your utility. So you might have you know, 20 different actions you go through and search for the one that gives you the highest expected utility. OK? Uh, and I mean, I could talk a little bit about here why you would want to do that. But basically, uh, just very briefly, if you're repeating an, uh, you know, uh, an action over and over again, say thousands of times, then you're going to get the highest sum by choosing the maximum expected utility in every individual case. So you might not get it on uh, a particular instance because the probabilities go against you, but if you do it thousands of times, then, um, then it maximizes your utility over time. Okay, so what are these utilities? I've said to, you know, they're, they're rankings over preferences um, and to be cautious not to interpret too much into the numbers that you see. Um, they're essentially hypothetical measurements of preference and that's it. Okay, so say for instance we've got, uh, we'll run through an example um, to show you how, that we, how we can construct utilities. So we can determine pre preferences pretty easily um, so we can say, you know, out of apple, orange, and banana, which one do we prefer? Um, and then once we've picked, say, you know, a, a topmost preference, we say apple is our most preferred, then we go to the next two and we say, what about orange and banana? Which one do we prefer out of those two? And then we've got a, a complete ordering um, over all of our possible outcomes. Apple is preferred to orange, preferred to banana. So the assumption here is that, if you know the, the terms, um, this is a transitive relationship. Um, Transitivity isn't violated, but if it is, then things are very different. But if you don't know what that means, ignore it. <laughs> okay, so we've got apple is preferred to orange, is preferred to banana. Uh, once we've got this situation, uh, so Frank Ramsey showed that um, how we can construct utilities for these different preferences. Okay, so we can pick our anchoring points, our two endpoints. And we can say apple is our most preferred, banana is our least preferred. We can set two numbers, again, arbitrary. That can be arbitrary numbers. We could make this 200, 500, 1,000, doesn't really matter. Okay? The same thing with this, we could make this, uh, we could even make it negative if we wanted. 
the choice of unit is arbitrary. Okay, and once we've set that up, what we can do is give people a, a, a choice, a lottery, in order to work out uh, what the, that person's utility over orange is. So we've, we've essentially defined apple and banana, and we just need to know where orange sits on that scale. OK, so we give people a choice. We can say, all right, either I give you an orange with probability 1, um, or I'm going to give you an apple or a banana with some probability. OK, and I'm going to vary this probability uh, until Essentially, this is a scale until this scale balances. Okay, so we're saying, all right, let's. Uh, we might start with you know a ninety percent chance of getting the apple, and they might say, no, I still prefer the orange. What about eighty percent, and so forth? Uh, and then you go down to um, say a seventy percent, and then they say, yep, I'm indifferent between the, those two options. You could either give me uh, just the orange, or you could give me this this lottery between the apple and the banana, and I'd be equally happy. Once you've determined that, you can then just go through and calculate uh, what that would be. So we know the utility of apple, we know the utility of banana, uh, so we can weight that in this um, equation here. And then we say, okay, the, the utility of the orange then is 70. So we had our scale, apple's 100, orange is 70, um, and banana is zero on our scale. And we can do this for any number of options that we um, have. If we have preferences over 20 different things, we can continue to elicit these different things. It might take a long time, but you can, you can do it. The assumption there is that everything you know, obeys certain rules, P people's preferences obey certain rules, and in a lot of cases it doesn't, but uh, approximately it works really well. Okay, so one mistake that's, that's really, really common is that people equate utility uh, with money. Uh, so you can't do that. As I said, the numbers that you pick for that scale are essentially arbitrary. You could, you know, uh, you could shift them up and down by any number amount, or you could multiply them by any uh, amount, and they'll stay the same. Um, in many cases, you can, all you're interested in is maximizing profit. If that's the case, you can say, okay, the expected dollar amount, that's good enough. We'll just maximize the expected dollar amount. But in the vast bulk of real decision making cases, that's not what you're interested in. So, money in the future, for instance, should be discounted compared to money in the present. So, there's lots of reasons for this. Uh, the most common people that, reason that people think of is the inflation rate. Uh, so, you, you know, the, the value of money tends to go down over time, so you want to discount for that. That's certainly not the only reason. You've got, uh, if somebody gives you money just before you die, that's not very useful to you. <laughs> you want it earlier on. Oh, what happened? Okay. Um, yeah, so you've got more opportunities um, if, if you've got the money earlier on. Uh, okay, and we'll just wait up. What happened? <laughs> the laptop or the other oh, tablet. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so you've got various things that discount, uh, you know, money in terms of time. So the mapping between money and, and utility is not um, one to one. But it's also the case that even if you d do the discounting on the money. Um, it's, it's still rarely equal to utility. So for instance, uh, if, if somebody suddenly gave me a million dollars, I'd be ecstatic, that would be fantastic, that would be really good. If someone gave somebody very wealthy, like a, you know, Bill Gates or something, a million dollars, then he might be quite happy, but not nearly as happy as I would be. <laughs> okay, so as you accumulate money, it has less and less value for you. Okay, so, the so in terms of the psychology of utility, um, people have different what's called risk profiles. So some people can be risk averse, some people can be risk seekers, um, and that's independent of all the time discounting and all the rest. Um, so for instance, uh, it, risk aversion is extremely common, it's usually the most common um, profile, risk profile that people have. So I'm gonna uh, ask you these three questions and what I'm going to do is um, 
just put up your hand. So this is, these are the three options that you have. Um, and so just put up your hand in terms of which option that you would prefer um, out of these three. Okay, so let's start with the first one, a certain $100. If I said I would give you a certain $100, would you take that over the other two options? Show of hands. One, yep. Yeah. Okay, suppose I said uh, there's a 50% chance that I'll give you 200 uh, and a 50% chance that I'll give you nothing at all. So who would take that option? One, two, three, four, yep. Yeah. Okay, and then there's the final option. I'll give you a 50% chance of getting $300 or a 50% chance that you have to pay me $100. Who would go? <laughs> Adam, yeah? Owen, sort of. <laughs> okay. So, interestingly, actually, most people uh, chose this, which is not entirely risk-averse. <laughs> Typically, most people choose the certain 100 um, because they're guaranteed of getting the, getting the 100 regardless. But this is the kind of thing that a, a game like, uh, you know, a game show like Deal or No Deal, you know, kind of sets up. It basically asks this question over and over and over again. And most people tend to go for the lower amounts in that. Okay. So a decision network is, as I said previously, it's just a basic Bayesian network um, and it adds on top all of the infrastructure for working with decisions, so just the utility nodes and the um, action nodes. Uh, there's the chance nodes that we've already seen. Uh, decision nodes, which are usually represented by something square if you've got a, a you know, just a diagram of the basic uh, symbols, is usually uh, represented by something square. Uh, and utility nodes are usually represented by something diamond shaped. Okay. So we have an example here. I'll let you read through it. So this is an example decision problem. Um, and then I'll show you how we can put that together. Okay, so we've got this idea that, um, you know, we have Claire who's trying to make a decision about whether or not to accept a bet uh, based on the, the outcome of a game uh, and whether John is going to, uh, or, or herself, is going to buy the bottle of wine. Okay, so we can start off with uh, building our network pretty much the way that we would normally build our base net and just focus on the probabilities of different things. So we can say, let's start with the result of the game. That's kind of the key um, outcome that we want to model. So we'll do that. Then we'll say, well, what influences the result of the game? It depends on? Performance. Well, it depends on player's performance, sure. Um, yep, definitely depends on. So we could include that as well. Um, and if we had some information and so forth, um, we could include that into the model, and that, that would be useful. Um, but we've also got, um, I guess, the... the, okay. the, the the bet, um, that won't influence the result of the game, hopefully. Uh, the, weather. The, weather. the weather, yep, that's right. Okay, so we'll include the weather into the model. So there is lots of, lots of other things that we could put into this model, but we're just going to concentrate on the weather. Okay, now that we start doing things a little bit differently, so we include our decision, whether or not to accept a bet. So we're just gonna put it here for now. Uh, and we'll note that, okay, the different outcomes, the different values of different situations depend both on the result and whether or not we accept the bet. Because if we don't accept the bet, then it's just, you know, doesn't really matter. Our utility is just based on whether our team wins or not. Uh, but if we accept the bet, then it's a combination of the two. Okay, so what we would do uh, is put in a utility node and say that it depends on both the result and whether we accept the bet or not. Okay, so then this is our basic network structure. We've, we've got all the mechanics needed to make the decision. We can add in our CPTs. So these CPTs are the same as normal. There's nothing different there. This is a little bit different. Um, it essentially looks like a, a CPT because you've got all the combinations of the parents and everything. 
But what we put here is not probabilities, but utilities. So we're saying, if Melbourne wins and we accept a bet, that's the best possible outcome. So we'll, we'll put that at the top. 40, we've put 40 here, but it could be 400, could be 1,000, doesn't really matter. Uh, if Melbourne loses um, and we did accept the bet, that's the worst possible outcome. So we've got minus 20. Uh, and then we can put uh, numbers in here, uh, just based on what we think the utility is. Um, now, these numbers here, it's, it's, I should point out, we've got, um, we've got here the, you know, the, the cost of the wine was $30, and we might have some other costs involved. That comes into your thinking about what your utility is, but that is not your utility. OK. So once you've, once you've built this network, a procedure for then working out which action you should take um, is to go through, set the decision node to that value, so set accept bet to that value, um, and then you ca calculate the expected utility based on the probabilities. So that's something that you don't have to do you know, manually, but this is something that, uh, say, Adnetica will do in the background for you. And I'm quite sure Agena risk, although I haven't actually looked. OK, so if we did do this manually, uh, we'd run through the calculations, so we'd say the probability of winning times the utility of winning given that we accepted the bet, plus the probability of losing times the utility of losing given that, uh, that we accepted the bet as well. So that's our accept bet calculation, and we can work through and get to the number there. Uh, we can do the same thing for accept bet no, work through and then uh, work out what the number is there, and then compare these two numbers. If we did this in Netica, it will do this automatically as soon as we hit compile because it, it will calculate the yes case and the no case and automatically tell us which one has the highest value. So in this case, uh, it's clear that we shouldn't accept a bet. Okay. Now, if we've got, um, so we had a previous model here. So if we ignore that, that's our previous model. We can add in um, another variable called forecast. And our forecast will inform our, whether we accept the bet or not. So we can check the forecast and say, well, it looks like it's going to be you know, a good day. That, that means my team's going to perform better. Maybe I'll accept the bet. This doesn't actually do anything in the, in the engine. So it's not like it comes into the inference in any way. Um, but it does allow you to then systematically say, for this value of a forecast, this is what I'll do. For this value of a forecast, you know, this is what I'll do. And Netica will produce um, a table for you automatically, which I think is on the next slide. <clears throat> so if you then open up the utility node, it will actually write in the values here. This is a slightly weird thing that uh, Netica does, in my opinion. It actually puts, this is normally the CPT view. Uh, what Netica will do is automatically fill this table for you, and you're, it's, it's a read-only table, so you can't actually change it. Um, but it will say, OK, if it was raining, you should accept a bet. Uh, if it's cloudy or sunny, then you should. OK. So here's, a, here's another problem. Um, I'll give you a moment to read it. So this is about um, what to do if you've got a fever. OK. So. We've got a case where we're trying to work out whether we should be taking an aspirin uh, for our fever. We know that um, it's possible that we might react badly to the, to the aspirin, and that will influence um, whether we take it or not. Uh, OK, so we've got a, a simple network here. Uh, so this is, has elements of a, a dynamic Bayesian network, which, we'll, which you'll see tomorrow. <coughs> Basically, we've got this time slice over here, and then this time slice next time slice over here. But it's not done as a, as a DBN. It's just done with differently named nodes. OK? So we uh, start off with our flu node, and we say that whether we're or not we've got flu influences whether or not we're going to have a fever. Uh, whether or not we have a fever is going to you know, influence the reading on our thermometer. Uh, and whether or not we've got a fever will influence whether we have it later as well. So there's a certain inertia to the fever. Um, now this here, this dashed line, that means it's an information link. So it's not a causal link. It's not that th uh, the thermometer causes you to take an aspirin. It's just something that informs you about whether to take it or not. 
Um, so you would use that um, the reading on the thermometer to make your decision. Uh, then once you've got uh, your reaction, so there's a certain probability of reaction uh, after taking the, um, the aspirin, uh, with the combination of that and the fever, then you've got some utility uh, here. Okay, so we've got some, we've built our network, uh, we've parameterized it, we've gone through everything. Um, okay, so now this is the, the no fever case. <clears throat> so you'll see here these numbers are basically the same. We're kind of saying we're indifferent really, whether we take the aspirin or not. Um, but if we then take a reading on the thermometer and it shows that we don't have a fever, uh, then we definitely, we pretty much don't want to take an aspirin. It's fairly clear. Uh, if it turns out uh, that the reading on the thermometer is true, then we very, you know, we strongly want to take the aspirin. Um, and the other case is not here. <laughs> but if we were, to say, for instance, to, to, you know, have a reaction to the aspirin, uh, then that would change things again. Okay, so we can list out uh, the scenarios um, in a more formal way. We can say we've got. Uh, these different evidence scenarios that we're interested in. We can say that we've got no evidence, uh, the two different cases of when we've got um, two different types of reading on the thermometer. Uh, and then we've got when the thermometer reads true and we take it uh, and we actually have a reaction. So we've listed different cases. We could list more cases if they're of interest, but that's all we've listed. Uh, we can then do the probability of the flu and then take the expected value and so forth. And then uh, come across a decision under different, e diff different evidence scenarios. Okay, so the only case here, for instance, uh, out of all of these three scenarios in which we would want to take the aspirin, is when uh, the thermometer shows that we've got a fever and we don't know anything else. Okay, so we saw two types of decision networks. We've got, <coughs> we had the football decision network earlier. Um, which was a, a non-intervening type of network. So what that means is that we've got um, our decision here, which feeds directly into the utility, um, and then some outcome of the world which also feeds into the utility. Um, or we've got our intervening node, uh, intervening type of network, decision network, in which our decision influences some probability first, and via that probability influences the utility. So it does it indirectly. Uh, through some, some other variables in the model. Okay, so sometimes we need to make uh, multiple decisions. Um, so that's quite easy to do in something like Netica. You can add in additional action nodes for all of the decisions that you need to make. Uh, the only thing is that there needs to be some ordering, some priority over those decisions. Okay, so you can't say for every possible combination uh, of decision that you could make, what are all of the different expected utilities? You have to specify an ordering. This is mainly a technical limitation, so. Um, okay, so when you build your network in Netica, uh, you either need to specify the order, so you need to specify that uh, your first action, so for instance, doing a test comes before doing some action. Uh, or when you've built your network, if you haven't specified an order and you don't really care what the order is, Netica will put one in randomly for you because it needs to enforce that technically. So. Uh, and I don't know if Eugenia Risk does the same thing, but um, Genie, the, so the various different pieces of software do this very differently. <laughs> They're all quite different. Um, so Genie will uh, put in your, the precedence links, but you can actually check the full combinations um, for different nodes, and it puts them at different stages of the, the sequence. Uh, Netica doesn't do it at all. You'd have to do it in code um, to do it. And a gene risk, I don't know. So, uh, so in Netica, this is what um, it would look like. Uh, I think Netica uh, will not highlight the, the link in any way, uh, so it'll just look like an ordinary arc. Um, but you just have to keep in mind that if it's going between two decision nodes, um, then it's a precedence link, uh, not, a, not a causal link. Okay. Um, all right, so we've got, um, so we've got some case, uh, you know, some example here, in which we've got, uh, we're trying to work out whether we should do a treatment um, 
based on whether or not we've got some kind of disease. So we do, uh, we do a test first, that'll influence our finding, then the finding will be an information leak, that is we, you know, we'll work out whether to do the treatment based on both, the, both of the finding and the test, whether we've done the test or not. So that's the, sorry, that's the precedence link. Um, okay, so if we entered in, so if we say yes, we'll do the test. Um, so you'll notice here initially we've got numbers here, but no numbers here. Okay, so Netic is already calculating forward to see what's the best possible, what's the optimal action to take at this point. So you say, okay, we'll take the optimal action, which is to do the test, because it's less negative. Uh, and then we've got the treatment, then it calculates uh, the value of doing the treatment once we've specified that first action. Okay. Uh, if you wanted to model joint decisions in something like Netica, then it's pretty straightforward. You just put them all into the one node. Uh, that's going to blow out really quickly if you've got lots of actions, so that's not very practical. So, <laughs> um, if, if it's any realistic problem, you probably don't want to do that. Uh, most of the time, if you want to deal with that kind of a problem, it becomes a search problem. You have to search through the space of, um, you know, combinations of actions to work out which is, um, which is optimal. Okay, so uh, I think we've got, yep, an example. Um, okay, so we're going to modify the native fish network in this example. Um, so I'll give you a moment to read that. Okay, if people have read through that. Yep. Um, all right, so we can analyze this problem and start looking for what the decisions are. So have we got some sense of what the decisions might be in this extension? Any thoughts? Pesticide, yep, the amount of pesticide to use. Um, and there's, uh, well, at least one more. How much water? Yep, that's right. Yep. Okay, so that's two different things that we can do. So uh, we can either say how much water to take, or we can say whether we're going to take any water at all, which is what we're going to do then. Uh, what are the costs and benefits? Yep, that's right. Yep. And the fish. Yep, the effect on the fish. Yep. Any other? Values that we want to track. The yield on the crops, presumably. The yield on the crops, yep. Good. That's it. Okay, so we've got the pesticide cost. Uh, we've also got the irrigation cost, how much that costs to do that. Uh, the reduction in the native fish abundance, and I think we've got crop yield in there as well. Um, yes, increase in crop yield, um, and whether we've got an increase in native fish. Okay. So we can add these things to our network. So you'll recognize the original network roughly. Uh, so we've got these nodes up here They're from the original network, uh, this and this and this, and tree condition. Okay, so that's all from the original network. What we've said is we already had a pesticide use node in the network, but originally we were modeling it as something that we had no control over. It was just something that you know, the irrigators or the farmers were choosing to do. Now we're saying, okay, well this is something we can control. So we've converted this to a decision node. Um, so it's gone square, and in Netica it's colored blue. Uh, we've done the same thing with irrigation. So we've now added a node called ir irrigation, which we didn't have previously. Um, and we've linked it into our network. And now we have the different costs associated uh, with everything. So we've got the cost of the pesticide, the cost of irrigation, uh, the income, so the, the benefits uh, that we get from the crop yield, increased crop yield, and the environmental value. So we've got all of the pieces um, that we're interested in. We might be interested in other parts. We might be interested in the tree condition. Uh, we might be interested in the river flow for, for whatever reason. But for this particular modeling problem, we've said, no, the values that we're interested in are just these ones. Okay? Okay. So we've created our network. You'll see here 
we've got our precedence link. So we're saying pesticide use is the first action. Yep. Um, could we have a decision node that is constrained by pesticide? For example, can you say that if mm -hmm. anywhere we install, we are above zero maturation, we cannot build it? Uh, yes. You can build that constraint in. You'd, you'd have to. Um, build extra nodes into the network to actually build that constraint in, but you can. Um, alternatively, you can just say, um, plug in the annual rainfall into your decision and say that that's something that the decision maker is essentially handling. Um, so yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so a first, first choice of, uh, um, is how much, whether to use pesticide use or how much pesticide um, to use. Um, Okay, and so then Medica gives us a calculation, goes through, calculates the expected value again based on all of these nodes. So it, it sums everything up automatically for you once you've got multiple utility nodes in there. Um, okay, so if, here we slightly prefer using high, a high amount of pesticide when we've got no evidence. If we entered in other evidence, that might change, but under no evidence, we slightly prefer high pesticide use. Not much of a difference, really. Okay, um, oops, this didn't change. <laughs> okay, so as before, basically, we can then enter in an action for pesticide use, uh, and then that influences, that will then allow us to calculate whether we should irrigate or not. Uh, it's not here for some reason, but you will see it in, in an in exercise, because I think we've got plenty of time for that. Okay, so we got through that quite quickly. So there's plenty of time for exercises. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. Okay, so the basic idea be behind decision networks um, is that you've got this concept of expected utility, um, and that's what your networks can now calculate for you. It can calculate the expected utility of different actions. Uh, and what you want to do is, um, in order to maximize your long term, accumulation of utility, you want to maximize it for any given um, instance. Uh, it requires a, an assessment of a utility, so you need to elicit the utilities from someone, so you've usually got stakeholders, you know, different stakeholders who are interested in the outcome uh, of some result, so you want to elicit the utilities from those people. There's some issues there in terms of how you combine the utilities, and um, this is something that uh, Abada will, will be looking at in her PhD quite a bit. So. Um, but for the most part, for the, for the BARD project, that's not quite so critical. Well, we probably will have fairly limited examples uh, of this. Um, and these kind of networks can be used to support uh, Bayesian decision making. So, there's probably quite a few questions. We should normally break that up with exercises, but we haven't <laughs> here. So, just before we go into the exercises, do we have uh, questions? No, we might get stuck into some exercises then. <laughs>